Can roads and bridges demystify the ADD brain? Well, we're going to find out today with Dr. Ron Sterling, a psychiatrist and the author of the Adult ADD Factbook. Welcome, Dr. Sterling. Thank you so much for having me. And I really like the title. It helps simplify concepts to think in terms of roads and bridges. So thanks a lot. And by the way, if, if you're interested in, in all of these facts that we're going to be talking about today and an awful lot more, the name of the book is The Adult ADD Factbook. Uh, but first, before we get into roads and bridges, I've got to go, go over what we have is something very recently that just came out as we record this show, and it's explaining the rise in, AD, in, in ADHD, and it's the same thing essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And this is with uh, Dr. Lieberman of Columbia, and here was something I really found interesting. That's the APA president right now. Okay, here's something I really found interesting. He said, public schools can receive financial incentives to have students in special education uh, or remedial education programs, and families with lower incomes can receive subsidies and disability support if their children have diseases of cognitive uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. My question is, is, is this part of the rise in ADD, and is it something that's for real, or is it something that is driven by those who are seeking to make money off of it? A big question, <laughs> so I'll give it my best shot. Um, excuse me for sort of pausing for a second, but it is a big question. Uh, so the problem with the, all of these kinds of discussions about the rise in ADHD um, is that people are not differentiating between symptomatic ADD and asymptomatic ADD. So ADD is, is a brain state. It's a, it's a, a state of a dopamine function that affects working memory and other parts of cognitive uh, processing and, and information processing. It's there whether it shows up or not because it's genetic. So what makes it show up is really the issue, not whether it's there or not. So you could, let's say, do uh, dopamine genotyping, and you could discover how many people in the population, in a particular population, might have uh, high-risk uh, dopamine dysfunctional genes that would tend to set them up for poor working memory. And then you could determine what the prevalence is at that level. So before but that we get prevalence to at the genetic level is not the same as what's being diagnosed because it doesn't necessarily manifest itself until you hit the wall with data processing. So what we have going on in the United States and, and other parts of the developing world, not so much in the undeveloped uh, countries, but in the developed countries, we have data loads that are skyrocketing. So if you were to like take a look at a personal data load per hour, per capita, in a particular area of New York City or LA or Seattle or something, you could literally come to some fairly good conclusions about what the data load was like per hour, per person in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. It goes up exponentially. Okay, before we get too far, because you said an awful lot. I have I'm sorry. a great big huge question and you've got a great big huge answer that is over my head. So I gotta ask so, this. When you say talk about data load, are you talking about all the messages that come to my brain constantly from watching television, listening to the radio, being on the internet, et cetera? I'm talking about the exposure that we have to information uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, cell phones, we didn't start carrying them around with us until 90s. So just carrying a cell phone with us is actually increasing our, what we deal with. If we're going to text message, plus listen to voice messages, plus have conversations, plus, plus, plus. And drive at the same time. Uh, that's huge amount of data compared to what we used to deal with. Even population density increases data load because the more people you bump into in a given day, mm -hmm. the more you absorb a fair amount of data. Is ADD a disease? It's uh, a brain state. It's not really a disease uh, because... So is it necessarily bad? No, it's not. It's, I don't, honestly, even though there's an official diagnosis in the DSM-5, which is the official diagnostic book for mental disorders, 
I don't consider it a disorder because it has an upside that's very significant and a downside that's also very significant. That's what gets people mostly in trouble is the downside. But the non-ADD brain, let's say somebody who has optimal dopamine function, they don't have any problems with working memory, but they also have a huge downside, which is more hypertension, more uh, cardiovascular disease because of that, uh, more strokes because of cardiovascular disease, more dementia because of strokes. So I'm just saying there's a huge downside to optimal dopamine. It's different, no working memory problems, but it actually has a lot of downsides. So for instance, people in Europe have 60% white people in Europe who you could say stayed behind back in the old days, didn't come across, families that didn't migrate so much. 60% higher blood pressure on average than white people in America. What does that have to do with ADD? Uh, notoriously, people with ADD have lower blood pressures because they don't put out as much uh, alarm bells in a given month as people with optimal dopamine do. Speaking of alarm bells, whenever I am on this particular station, CNBC, I'm hearing alarm, alarm bells with a ding, ding, ding when it's time to buy some more stock. Well, let's go to this. Here is the ADD <laughs> epidemic. This was just the other day, a few days ago on CNBC. They first off, they talked about in 2003, the total number of kids aged right. 4 to 17 diagnosed with ADD was 4.4 million. As of 2011, it's 6.4 million kids. I don't know what it is in 2014. But here's something interesting that they, they, say, they said, a well-respected physician on the CNBC program, again, it's an investment whole right, network, mm -hmm. studying behavioral issues and attention spans for 50 years, he, and he's not some quack, as they say, there's just popped up. He's convinced that ADD doesn't even exist. Wow, it's a much more diagnosed here in the United States than in other countries. Is that <laughs> right? Why is it more diagnosed here than other countries? Well, that's one. And two, does ADD even exist? Well, there, there's a book that just came out uh, written by a fellow that really questions whether ADD exists as a uh, entity with all of those parts to it uh, related to inattentiveness, impatience, impulsivity, all those things. He's broken it down in a sense saying, no, it's not, that's not ADD. That's different things happening at the same time, which has now been grouped into something called ADD. That's a very difficult proposition that he has come up with because in science, we try to come up with things that can be explained as simple as possible to explain all of those things as not having a common denominator is next to impossible, then they actually do have a common denominator and it's, it's poor dopamine function. Poor dopamine function currently uh, is diagnosed as ADD, but there are other aspects of poor dopamine function which aren't just working memory. You can have, let's say you can treat your low dopamine function with tobacco. You can treat it with a lot of different things that we find to be popular in America and other countries too, but not necessarily in some countries where there isn't as much ADD, when you say, so to speak. When you say you treat low dopamine levels with tobacco, are you, I mean, that's not a prescription. No, but people discover that if they uh, do tobacco a certain way, they don't end up with withdrawal or addiction or tolerance, but they can actually crunch numbers better after they take their break in the afternoon and have a smoke break. So here's, so here's, what, and here's why we started the show off this way. We started the show off with two um, descriptions of ADD essentially as money makers for the entities. One of them was the public schools and another one is companies, right. pharmaceutical companies. Right. And it's really, it's really easy to be able to say, well, this bad thing happened, so this person must have ADD, so we need more ADD drugs. It's, it's almost ironic in a way because if, if we can actually let ourselves understand the data better in terms of how much dopamine dysfunction there is in the Western Hemisphere, we would be able to maybe restructure things a bit in our society so that we don't have to rely on medication to deal with uh, a dopamine dysfunction that's causing us trouble in an environment 
where the data loads are so high. Would you say that again? Because, uh, because I want to make sure that, that I understand it. Are you saying that we actually can adjust um, the incidence of ADD or the function so that ADD doesn't happen? We can, uh, we can design us, uh, honestly, if you want to take a look at different kinds of societies and cultures, we currently have a culture that is basically taking advantage of our impulse control problems, our impatience, in other words, our dopamine dysfunction. So yes, there's money that is being spent, and it's ironic in a sense because it's kind of like trying to find an impulsive solution to an impulsive problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. It's like you, you, when you start throwing money at things and not thinking about what you're doing, you're basically reacting in an impulsive way rather than a planned way. So we have this, we want quick fixes for ADD. Isn't that interesting? Because ADD always wants quick fixes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of ironic that we're trying to do a quick fix on a problem where quick fixing is a part of the diagnosis. I want to make sure that everybody knows that the name of the book is Adult ADD Fact Book by Dr. Ron Sterling, uh, who has researched this quite a bit. It is available on Amazon. It's up on the screen right now. Um, Dr. Sterling, why is this of such an interest to you? Why don't you just go and do what psychiatrists do, which is to help people get better? Or is that what you're doing with this book? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Well, uh, I, I really didn't start out taking a look at ADD. Uh, it, resulted from trying to look at culture in America. So that led me down the path of looking at dopamine function mm -hmm. in the Western Hemisphere, and that led me down the path of looking at ADD, and it's pretty much deciding that that was the priority for me to get that nailed down as much as possible, explain it to people, give them, we started out talking about roads and bridges. I want to make sure we do talk about that. Actually, let's, <laughs> let's just get to that right but, now. What do roads and bridges that, have to do with that? That's ADD? part of my trying to get the concepts out in such a way that people can understand what's creating, what's the common denominator to all of those things that are part of the diagnosis of ADD. And there is a common denominator. So roads okay. and bridges is about nerve cells and neurotransmitters. So there are these big, this is a big word called neurotransmitter. Everybody knows the word, but they don't know what it is. It is literally a temporary, simple chemical bridge between two nerve cells. So nerve cells rely on that bridge to transfer data from one nerve cell to the next one. If the bridge system has a problem, you got a problem. If the nerve cells have a problem, you have a problem. So you have to have a good amount of nerve cells. Alzheimer's is actually loss of nerve cells, not neurotransmitter. So you have to have good nerve cells and good bridges to have fully functional, efficient processing of information. If you have a bridge problem, you can automatically imagine what that would be like because everybody knows what happens when the bridge is not there and you get to the bridge and the river is flowing but the bridge is gone, well, that's the end of the street. That's the end of the cargo. That's the end of the information pathway and it tends to have to find some other way to go. So bridge, when you think of neurotransmitters as bridges, you can really get what's going on in the ADD brain because it's a suboptimal dopamine bridge system which affects the transportation of information. You can't carry as much information on your roads, your nerve cells, if you have bridge problems. So a simple solution, just pump in more dopamine, right? Get some more bridges, <laughs> get some better bridges. That essentially what most of the ADD meds do is increase dopamine function and presence in the, an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is where working memory is created. Let's bring up a, a graphic of the brain itself and let's talk about that. In, in, in this particular one, we're talking about the circuit boards of the threat monitor center. Is, is that, first off, I don't even know what the threat monitor center is. What does that mean? Well, this particular diagram is trying to show the two areas of the brain which are dopamine dependent. So what's interesting about neurotransmitters there's, there's several different kinds of neurotransmitters. 
you could say there's several different kinds of bridge systems. Some of those bridge systems are everywhere in our nervous system. Some of them are specialized. Dopamine is found mostly in the prefrontal cortex where working memory is created. And another area of the brain called the threat, I call it the threat monitor center. Traditionally, it's called the emotional brain. And the fellow that uh, invented that name and made uh, affective neuroscience really take off was uh, a fellow named Ledoux uh, in 1990, mid 1990s. So this but, is relatively new information that that we yes. have, a new understanding of, of the brain and how it works. Yes, this is really cool stuff. Oh, thanks. But now we have to go to the next level of is what can we do to to help people with with something that they want changed. And I'm not even saying to help people with a disease because it sounds like what you're saying is that it's not a disease. No, it, it's, a, it's a brain type. And once you know what type of brain you've got, like if you know that you don't have a dopamine problem, you have good working memory, you're gonna wanna probably try to make sure you're dealing with your possible hypertension and the things that are side effects of having mm -hmm. a good dopamine system. You've talked about working memory though. Before we go, go on, what does that mean? Working memory is essentially how much you can hold temporarily in a space in your head. It's the same as RAM in a computer. So if you know anything about RAM in a computer, you know that a low RAM computer uh, really can't hold much in RAM and therefore you're limited as to how many programs you can have open at the same time and other things. So the working memory in the human is ex exactly the same as RAM in a computer. RAM in a computer depends on electricity. Working memory depends on dopamine. Okay, so let's go back to the graphic then. We've got uh, the, the circuit boards of the thread monitor center. So how does that relate to dopamine? Well, that's the other area of the brain that's dopamine, that relies on dopamine, the dopamine bridge system to, to quotes, work properly. So the words work properly are problematic because what is proper? It's hard to define that in that world because there is an upside to low dopamine function in the threat monitor center. The upside is people who fit the criteria for ADD who have a dopamine problem, per, by definition, that's the, that's the problem, have better ability to handle threat situations because of their low baseline dopamine. So when the threat comes in to anybody, any person, mm -hmm. it will increase dopamine in the brain through the threat monitor because the threat monitor is monitoring all your sensory data. So if you stick your hand in a fire, you're gonna get a ton of sensory data coming through your heat monitors in your skin. It's gonna flood your brain, the parts of the threat monitor system which are monitoring heat sensors in your skin will start pumping dopamine out. Well, let's talk about something that we all know and love that, that probably Im immediately goes to the threat monitor center, and that's professional football. <laughs> yeah. If, well, if you're looking at a professional football player, one who always comes through in the clutch, can you make a generalization about his dopamine levels? I would say, uh, I don't know if I would uh, bet money on it, but I would probably come close to it, uh, that anybody who can handle competitive environment, possible injury, in other words, threats, high threat situation uh, in terms of, of possible injury and, and, and shame and all kinds of things can hurt in that situation. Yes, a person who has, starts off with a, a lower dopamine level in that situation is gonna do better in that situation than somebody with optimal dopamine who might just freeze or get longer reaction times or lose their cognitive ability, get fuzzy, literally jittery and fuzzy. So if you are the general manager of the Seattle Seahawks where, where I live, um, would you be wanting to take dopamine levels? Or if you were the head of, a, of the police department, uh, would you want to be taking dopamine levels of candidates? Yeah, well you can't measure dopamine levels yet. You can't, and how come? may never be able to because it, it sits inside of the nerve cell as well as being outside of the nerve cell and it's constantly moving in and out. So you can get pictures 
now that's why we have so much good information about it since 2008. You can compare a group of brains to a group of brains, but individual dopamine levels you can't really do yet. You can get an idea of dopamine levels by genotyping, but that's a $10,000 proposition. And uh, it's coming down in price, but at the same time, well, you know, I don't guys think I'd want to see well. people. I don't think I'd want to see people uh, genotyping for the purposes of hiring for football uh, or Why not? any other. It makes a lot of money. We've already started off the show with, with two things. Because there will be people with optimal dopamine who still can pull off good. Let's put it this way: quarterbacks might quite often be more optimal dopamine, simply because. They have to do a lot of thinking under uh, conditions, but they don't have to worry quite as much about attack. They have to worry about defense and staying alive and uninjured and doing their job. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that you wouldn't want to genotype so much uh, to try to figure out who might be the best in what situation, because there will be people even with good dopamine who will still be high functioning in sports, just not many of them. Mm. I want to take this to even a more serious level, though. Uh, let's go to the, t the Tarnak Farm incident uh, of the early 2000s with um, there were so many different uh, Canadian soldiers who died under friendly fire. Right. As the investigation went along, ADD played uh, an issue in that, did it not? Well, sort of. They didn't actually bring up, uh, as far as I know, now I, I have looked at that and written about it. It's in my book on page 113 or so. Uh, and the reason that I even brought up that incident in my book is one of the things I say to people who fit the criteria for ADD is if you're going skydiving in the afternoon and you have, uh, let's say, uh, your biology test in the morning, you might not want to be on a long-acting ADD med because you'll do better skydiving with an ADD brain than you will with a non-ADD brain. But you won't do so good in testing with an ADD brain. So the reason I say that is because exactly kind of this uh, idea that this is a performance enhancing, that increasing dopamine is performance enhancing is true for people who have a dopamine problem, but for people who don't, it does not increase performance. It decreases performance. They've done study after study that shows that too much dopamine, above optimal dopamine, messes up reaction times, messes up thinking, judgment gets worse. So the Tarnak uh, incident was a pilot, one of our pilots, a jet pilot, who was on patrol, standard patrol, but he had been, on, he, they were dispensing what are called go pills, uh, which can stand for a couple of different kinds of chemicals, but essentially in his situation, dextroamphetamine. And dextroamphetamine is a standard in a sense, uh, one of the important ADD meds. So you, if you give us a, a, a pilot on patrol dextroamphetamine or let him use dextroamphetamine to allegedly increase his performance, it's not going to increase his performance. If he has ADD, he'd be better on patrol with ADD. That means no meds. If he doesn't have ADD, you're going to really mess him up because his function is going to go even worse. And it's exactly what happened. If you look at what he did in that situation, he did exactly what people do who have too much dopamine on board. He froze in a sense. He got locked in, inflexible, disobeyed commands, and misinterpreted data completely. His Canadian troops were conducting um, practice at night and he thought they were firing at him. So it's not, I, I, you know, if, if the military that? has some data that they're not letting us know about, I don't know. But honestly, as far as all the science goes, if you want to stay up and fight fatigue, use caffeine. If you're going to mess with your dopamine system, you're going to mess with reaction times, organization, all kinds of judgment issues. Hmm. Um, 
I want to go to this next graphic, and it's a map of the world. And uh, we've got ADD uh, really kind of centered in the United States. I think you've said that it actually should grow uh, throughout uh, the Western Hemisphere. But yeah. right, right now, right now here in the world situation is there is the group over in Syria that is, has moved very heavily into Iraq. And, you know, it's very, very dangerous. Can we, sitting here in the West, make a statement about them and, their, and the ISIS group with regard to ADD or dopamine levels in the brain? Uh, probably not, but I mean, because that, that would be uh, a speculation, number one. Uh, a lot of the, actually, a lot of the Middle Eastern uh, population has fairly decent uh, levels of dopamine genes, so to speak, or not so much ADD risk factor going on there, especially uh, in certain subsects, um, certain subcultures of Jews have incredibly good uh, dopamine function. But um, so I, I don't know if you can assume things about that. But yes, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people that are um, fighting over territory and uh, and and have a culture of you know, hitting back, essentially, not negotiating. I don't think you can generalize about ADD in those cultures, but in terms of, of uh, the world prevalence of ADD, again, it's asymptomatic versus symptomatic. So you can't diagnose ADD currently without symptoms, right? If you genotyped people, you could make a prediction about what they might be able to handle or not handle. If you actually did data testing, presented them with testing loads, and figured out who had the least working memory in the population, you could figure out the, the prevalence that way. But when you have to wait for symptoms to arise, you're waiting until the ADD brain bumps into a challenge that pushes it far enough that it doesn't work so well. Here's the bad news, is that we've got hours left of material and we've got 30 <laughs> seconds left. So the question is, what's next for medical science in terms of determining ADD, the, the response to the ADD brain? Well, I think it's, it's becoming really clear since 2008. Progressively, each year, we keep coming up with more diagnosing and there's always a controversy, well, is it really ADD or not? Or are we manufacturing this in a sense? We're not manufacturing it, it exists. And when the data loads get high enough, it manifests itself. So we're in a situation where that's happening. So the next thing for science is to sort of take a look at, honestly, the structure of our society. We'll let that be the last word. This is Dr. Ron Sterling. The name of the book is Adult ADD Fact Book. There's an awful lot more to this story. Everybody take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world.